Hello, I'm Tony Vlahos for Execunet. Corporate innovation is a topic that attracts a lot of attention from academic researchers and both excites and confounds senior executives. Joining me to shed light on corporate innovation are two extraordinary faculty members at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Sarah A. Sewell is a professor of organizational behavior and senior associate dean. She's the director of the Stanford LEAD Personal Leadership Certificate. Sarah has written two recent books and serves in a number of nonprofit organization boards. Peter DeMarzo is professor of finance at the Graduate School of Business and the current president of the American Finance Association. He's also a co-author of the leading MBA corporate finance textbook and has received numerous research and teaching awards. Peter is the faculty director of Stanford LEAD and the Corporate Innovation Certificate. Sarah and Peter, it's good to be talking to you. Nice to be talking to you too, Tony. Yeah, great to meet you. So you guys spend a lot of time researching and working with executives on innovation. There often seems to be a wide gap between the aspirations of executives to innovate and their ability to execute. So what does an organization need to do to be innovative? Sarah, we'll start with you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tony. Uh, you know, I think first and foremost, what really needs to happen, and this sounds obvious, but it's much harder to do without having some coaching and some frameworks for thinking about this. But the first thing that needs to happen fundamentally is for a leader to develop a strategy. And it's one thing to say, oh, develop a strategy. And but 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 a lot of leaders have sort of forgotten how to do that or don't really need don't, don't really know how to do that, need frameworks for really thinking about what's the heart of their competitive advantage? What really is the value proposition that they have? Um, and and it, part of that process really involves thinking about very clearly what their goal is, but also thinking about what they're going to um, do in terms of trade-offs, making important decisions about trade-offs, about what they're going to do and what they're not going to do. And that piece of that, I think, can be very difficult for many, many leaders because there are all kinds of wonderful things that an organization can do, some of which should be part of what they're doing, but some of which pull them away from uh, their unique competitive advantage. So that's one piece of it. But then I think once a leader has been able to figure out what this strategy is and think about, and, and incidentally, when we talk about innovation and corporate innovation, we need to think about ways in which some organizations are really good at what we call exploring and developing sort of new um, innovations, novel innovations, figuring out uh, new places to go. But other organizations are also very, very good at exploitation. And I, I mention this because, um, and I'll give you a nice analogy of this. If we think about a mountain climber, uh, and we think about some mountain climbers who choose to take the, the well-trod path to the top of the mountain. They do this very, very quickly. They do it efficiently. They do it well. They stick to their knitting, in other words. Other mountain climbers decide that they're going to take a very different path and forge new paths and try new things. And sometimes they get there better and quicker and more efficiently. And sometimes they don't, but they learn a lot doing that. And the reason I mention this and the connection about this to strategy is really thinking about what, what sort of mode of learning and what sort of mode of action is an organization going to take. And the reason that's important is that once a leader has chosen what sort of, you know, what they're doing in terms of their strategy, they need to align their organizational design to better execute on that strategy. And that's the hardest part of, of organizational design because organizations that are set up really well to, to sort of exploit, to do the same thing over and over again and do it well, are set up really differently than those that are set up to explore, to be the mountain climber that tries to forge new paths to the top. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the second piece of this. And then the third thing that I'll mention, and one of the things, and we focus on all of these topics in our uh, corporate innovation certificate, but we also try to bridge to these topics as we are thinking about the personal leadership certificate. Because one key, um, element of all of this is being able to, once we've developed our strategy and created this organization to properly execute on that strategy, we really need to think about ways in which that we can train leaders to be able to communicate what that strategy is with effectively with story, to be able to think about ways in which they can be aware of the context in their organization so they can craft the story um, in a way that will resonate with the various players and, and individuals in the organization. 
and fundamentally to figure out how they can build themselves up as leaders to effectively be able to create innovation within their organizations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll add to that a little bit and talk about, uh, especially as the finance guy, some of the uh, uh, the quantitative side of this, which is also important. So again, as as Sarah said, it all starts with strategy and understanding that strategy and why it is that the firm that you're leading or that you're part of is good at what it does and what it should be focused on. Um, and once we understand that strategy, then there's a number of things that follow from that uh, immediately. Um, you know, how do we communicate that strategy? How do we communicate the story that goes with that about why we're doing what we're doing? Uh, how do we communicate it, obviously, with other employees in the firm? How do we communicate with customers? How do we communicate with investors? And certainly on the investment side, I mean, that's where, you know, the language of finance is really important because any new innovation, any new product, no matter how exciting, no matter how interesting it is, there's a time when we probably need to raise some resources uh, to implement that innovation, to implement that change. And we need to convince the other stakeholders who are going to be involved that, you know, it's really worthwhile for them to invest those resources in terms of uh, the type of return uh, that they're likely to get in terms of, you know, relative to the risk that they're taking and so forth. And so having uh, a strategy that's consistent both in terms of uh, the big picture story in the marketplace that we're trying to tell, but also making sure that the financial side uh, adds up and does lead to the kinds of returns that our investors, that our stakeholders are looking for, uh, for the investments that they're going to make is, is critical. And so we try to build all of those elements together in our executive education curriculum and, um, and the LEED certificate, uh, which we're uh, involved in, really tries to bring those pieces together so that we really have consistency between both uh, the financial side of the business and how we're communicating that story to our investors as well as the broader strategy and how we're communicating to our employees, to our customers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I'll add one more Please. piece to one of the things that we uh, teach a lot in our executive education programs, but also at, at, in the um, personal leadership and the corporate innovation uh, certificates is the importance of culture, organizational culture, and giving um, our participants, our students, ways to build cultures that will support innovation to help to foster mindsets in organizations that will lead individuals to be able to, within their own particular sphere of influence, be able to be creative, be innovative, be supported um, both financially, but also supported in terms of uh, how leaders may support these kinds of activities with either incentives or with um, various ways that people um, feel, um, feel valued for uh, adding to in creative and innovative ways to their organizations. Right. It's really part of, you know, encouraging that, you know, design thinking mindset where we need to experiment, we need to iterate. That's going to mean a certain amount of failure. And how do you create a culture where that failure is, you know, tolerated, but even in some many ways rewarded because it's viewed as necessary. We're not going to make the next leap uh, and get to the next step unless we're willing uh, to make those experiments, and many of them are likely to fail uh, before we find those home run successes. And, um, you know, we talk a lot about that from uh, looking at uh, real options and, and investment staging on the finance side, but also on the culture side. You need to have a culture that backs that up. If people feel like the career risk is much too high um, to, to take a chance to experiment, then you're not going to see innovation within your organization. Let's step off of that, that very important idea of learning from failure and expand the question to what challenges does an organization that wants to stimulate innovation face or what should they prepare for? What kinds of changes? Failure being one important aspect of it, what else would you advise that we who run companies think through and be prepared to embrace or, or work through as we stimulate innovation in our companies? I'll, I'll start if you don't mind, Peter, and then you can um, uh, jump right in. I think one of the biggest challenges that we face um, is fear. People are afraid. Mm -hmm. People are afraid of either being punished um, by their bosses or, or um, having their units be punished without getting the you know, appropriate finance that they may need for innovation. And I think figuring out a way to um, ensure people that 
uh, that, that fear is both natural, but also should be embraced, and that there are ways we can do this as leaders. And I'll give you one sort of um, way in which we talk about this, particularly in the personal leadership certificate, but we'll, we talk about this in our other executive education courses as well, is thinking about ways to build trust in our organizations. And uh, we give people some very leaders, some very practical ways to do this, which often um, mean that we teach uh, leaders about vulnerability, we teach them about humility, we teach them about having uh, deep conversations with uh, the people who work for them, with the people who, with whom they work, and as well as, of course, their superiors in an organization. Um, we, we give a lot of examples and exercises, for example, about how might you build um, a, a culture of trust in your organization by um, expressing vulnerability, by expressing humility, by recognizing when you as a leader fail, and talking about that so that other people feel a little bit more comfortable to, 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 um, to get out of their comfort zone knowing that they may fail. We also talk a lot in our various uh, courses about what uh, the uh, psychologist here at Stanford University, Carol Dweck and her um, colleagues and, and co-authors talk about, which is a growth mindset. How do we get people to think about ways in which they um, can try to embrace and try to build a growth mindset, by which we mean uh, embracing adversity and failure with gusto and with learning and with moving on, as opposed to thinking about a more fixed mindset in which individuals who um, are uh, faced with adversity uh, decide that it's really a, a, a trait of themselves and that they clearly, uh, there's nothing that they can do, nothing in their sphere of command which will allow them to learn from whatever this failure was. And then the last thing I'll say that we teach, and, and, and Peter already made reference, of course, to design thinking. Um, you know, we're at Stanford and design thinking comes into our courses in very many different ways, but one of the things that we often spend time uh, talking about are the, the capabilities of, um, of designers. And the one that I really like a lot, and we talk about this a lot, is the capability to embrace ambiguity and to be comfortable with ambiguity. It's hard, and it's, I think it gets harder the, the higher we get in organizations because people look to us and expect us to know all of the answers. But having the humility, getting back to what I said earlier, to embrace ambiguity and to say, I actually don't know what's going to happen from this, but it's going to be fun and we're going to learn something from it. And, um, and let's create a culture where people aren't afraid to, um, to exercise these kinds of, um, I think, very difficult uh, ways of operating in organizations. Sure. One of the things that um, are kind of related to that and on the finance side that we look at is, you know, the, the, again, going back to uh, the need to innovate, to experiment, to, to try lots of different opportunities and really search for those opportunities that are going to translate into, you know, creating lots of value for the organization. Um, part of that, and one of the things that we do in, in, uh, in the course that I, I had is look at the financial model around innovation and stress that, you know, we often think of uh, new value being created by the decision to launch new, new ideas, new products. That's where the value is coming from, is that, you know, we're going to start on something new and launch it. And one of the things that um, uh, we do is develop a financial model around that, and, and the students come to see that, in fact, many times a lot of the value is, is not so much from launching uh, new projects or, or new products, but knowing when to stop investing. Uh, in uh, a new innovation or a new product. That it's the two that go together that really allow you to kind of find the winners and, and focus on those. And a lot of organizations have diff more difficulty with that second step of, you know, we've, we've made a bunch of investments in something, it's not really turning out the way that we'd like to, and we stick with it longer than we should. And that notion of kind of learning, failing fast, and moving on to the next thing is something that it's important to show that even from a financial standpoint that that can make a big difference in how successful your organization is going to be. Um, but there is a psychological unwillingness to kind of admit the failure, uh, take the losses and move on. Uh, but that organizations that can do that and can do that effectively are going to be much more successful uh, with innovation. And so um, getting them to understand oftentimes, you know, it's not, it's the admission of failure and recognizing that we need to move on. That's the difficult step but having a culture that supports that, that recognizes that that is an important part of the innovation process is critical. Mm -hmm. Do you find that uh, companies, and we'll start with you, Peter, they measure innovation incorrectly? Do you measure innovation 
and its success the same as you would a, I'll say, a more uh, stable part of a strategy? Is there a difference there that we should be aware of as organizational leaders? Uh, that's a great question. And um, it does indeed require uh, some different thinking when we're looking at uh, innovations and the value they bring to an organization relative to more stable or more mature parts of the business. Um, we're looking at, you know, very stable and mature part of the business. Um, a lot of the, the, the value and the fluctuations in value are going to be driven by, you know, what's happening uh, over the next couple of quarters, right? And so a very short-term outlook uh, can make sense as we really just try to focus on continuing to deliver what we've been delivering, making sure that we're maintaining our, our margins and our profitability and so forth. When it comes to innovation, of course, in the short run, we're not going to be making money off of this product or this idea. We're going to be investing. We're going to be burning cash for some period of time. And so it's really a much longer term outlook that uh, one needs to take um, to really understand the value that can be created there. Um, and that's a very different you know, perspective that one needs to have. It's not about next quarter's earnings. Um, it's about what's the long run growth potential of this opportunity and you know, how much value might that bring a, a, at a longer horizon. And so being able to kind of communicate that story effectively, both internally and externally to investors can be tricky when you're trying to manage both things simultaneously. Um, and so we develop tools that allow um, uh, managers to understand what are the right milestones, what are the right targets that they need to achieve for these different types of investments when they're evaluating them because they need to be evaluated very differently. Okay. And I'll sort of add, if I may, too, Please. that you know, one of the things that we said early on and, and we say all the time is that um, you know, there's, there's uh, training that we do that is around the communication piece of this. Mm -hmm. So these, the, the finance piece and, and teaching the ways to think about this comes sort of hand in hand with some of the work that we do around communicating, developing a story, um, and making a compelling argument to the various stakeholders when these decisions need to be made. Mm -hmm. So where can leaders develop the skills and how can they develop the skills they need to be successful innovators? Um, Sarah, let's begin with you. Sure, sure. Uh, well, uh, you know, one of the things that Stanford Executive Education has, uh, I think, really built a name around is um, exactly that question. And whether we're talking about our on-campus offerings or the LEED certificate, our online um, offerings, I think that a core of very much about what our faculty teach is essentially around that. So whether one chooses to come to campus and have an immersive week long or two week long or six week long experience on campus um, or doing a one year long um, uh, certificate program, uh, this is a core of what it is that we teach. And we teach it, and I hope you're hearing this, and we, one of the wonderful things about having uh, the two of us together here is you have um, somebody from the finance side and somebody from the organizational behavior side who uh, I hope are giving you an idea of how we try to make sure that we marry both the, the, the finance and, and the sort of more quantitative side with the more qualitative soft skills That's side critical. of, yeah. um, of, of, of forging innovation and creating innovative leaders. And, and I'm very proud actually of what we do and how we um, as faculty collaborate and make sure that the work that we're doing in the classroom is reinforcing each other um, very well. Uh, so that's, I think, you know, a, at a core of what it is we do. Now down sort of into the weeds, part of what our model, and again, I'll talk specifically about the online model because one of the things uh, having, I, I teach a course in, in Peter's certificate on uh, organizational design for creativity and innovation. And one of the things that I have found as an instructor in this class is that the beauty of this, this particular um, uh, platform is that the participants come and they learn a framework they learn, uh, perhaps we read a case and they learn a framework. Uh, we have some video study of me talking about the case and so on. But they're also having online discussions with their partners, with the other people in the class. It, but then also, they, with every sort of piece of what they do, each, each module, they're, they're asked to apply it immediately to their organization and then reflect back on it, um, either in a private assignment just to me or uh, for the whole group to see. And so there's this automatic application of the frameworks mm. to their organizations in real time, reporting back to us and 
So I'm learning all the time as a professor, which is amazing, but they're learning from one another. And I also believe that when one applies what they're learning um, immediately to their organizational issue, it's it's the best way to solidify whatever those frameworks and concepts and so on are. Absolutely. So, yeah, it's terrific. Yeah, we've been delighted with the the lead certificate program. You know, we it's, we're in our third year now. We've had um, uh, great success with the program in terms of creating both a very uh, immersive and intimate and collaborative culture within the program. So even though it is online, um, students come in as a cohort, they interact, they work in teams, um, and we get a lot of interaction with them. Uh, um, uh, even though it's online, which is which is wonderful, um, and we it's very applied. So we're teaching them the tools, the skills that they can take right back to their organizations from day one and start implementing, start trying, start experimenting, reporting back to us about how it's going. Um, in the finance course, we help them initially. We build uh, a financial model for a product innovation that they can uh, develop in their organization. We then look at. Uh, models for valuing uh, their company and what are the real drivers of value for their business so they really understand what uh, to focus on as managers and how they can uh, kind of move the business forward. So uh, very applied and really kind of hands-on um, uh, uh, things that we do in each course. Um, and we cover the range of topics. As Sarah said, we have the organizational uh, behavior piece and how do we design organizations. Uh, we have the finance piece uh, we have courses on the neuroscience of change and how to kind of bridge the gap of, you know, we all desire change, but uh, we know that there are a lot of kind of internal impediments to change and how do we take advantage of the latest research in neuroscience, um, negotiation, how do you uh, kind of negotiate with others in your organization, with your customers, et cetera, to get them to buy in um, and understand the value for both sides. So lots of uh, different disciplines that we can bring to bear mm -hmm. and really have the students out there trying them in real time. Mm -hmm. That if sounds I, awesome, please. Oh, if I may add one more, sorry, Tony. I was just thinking about this as I was listening to um, Peter um, answer that question too. One of the things that we've also begun to do, which is really exciting, is to um, take these courses and deliver them for in, in custom online programs. And what I mean by that is one single company, for example, is interested in using some or all of this content. And we are able to take the pieces um, and put them together in a way that makes the most sense for these custom clients. But what's really great for us as faculty is that when this happens, it's like a deep dive into one single organization. Mm -hmm. And so we learn so much about this organization and we get to see- We can tailor the content to yeah, their needs. Exactly. exactly. And we tailor the content and then mm -hmm. we learn from the organization. Mm -hmm. And that, again, helps us to think about both our own research projects, which is great, mm -hmm. uh, but it also helps us to, to I think, make real impact, in, in, real impact and see it right away within an organization. So that's uh, another yeah. piece of this, which is kind of exciting. Well, it certainly sounds like a robust experience. And I will tell you that your knowledge and love for it is palpable. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like to sign up and, and learn from you as well. <laughs> we <laughs> so, <love that. laughs> so thank you so much for making time today and sharing your insights with me and our, our senior executive members about corporate innovation. And I look forward to learning more about the LEAD program and the other custom offerings that are offered by the Graduate School of Business at Stanford. So thank you again very much. Thank you, Tony. Thanks very much. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.